Hi there, folks. Welcome to Spectrum Pulse, where we talk about movies, music, art, and culture. And this week, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to, uh, for another retrospective look, this time at an album that came out earlier in the year, Shaking the Habitual by The Knife. Before we start, let's talk about minimalism. Now, you might think, with my general appreciation for acts like Meatloaf and Nightwish and Blind Guardian and The Killers and Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, that I tend to favor music that's overblown, overwrought, and generally made with a larger scope in mind. And I won't lie that I do like songs in this vein more often than I don't. Hell, I'll even give a pass to Andrew W.K. for his maximalist aesthetic, even though his lyrics tend to have less substance than an empty bucket made of air. And it's not surprising that a lot of critics tend to snub acts that go for broke with a complete lack of abandon and complete sincerity. These acts are often deemed lowbrow or pandering to baser sensibilities. And sure, in some cases, that is definitely the issue, but I'd argue that there's a method to writing that sort of hyperbolic material well. The difference, for example, between Fall Out Boy's Foi Les Deux and their newest album, Save Rock and Roll, which is an album I like less and less as a cohesive whole every time I listen to it. Likewise, minimalism often shares a similar differentiation in quality, but the distinction of being able to accomplish this aesthetic is a little subtler than its louder counterpart. Minimalism typically works through reduction, scaling back certain elements in order to draw attention and emphasis to others, or in order to create an atmosphere of emptiness and space. One of the reasons that Nick Cave and the Bad Seas succeeded so brilliantly this year with Push the Sky Away is because he utilized a minimalist style to both create a foreboding, expansive atmosphere and to draw attention to the oblique lyrics. It was no surprise then that some critics panned the album in response, especially considering Nick Cave spent so much of his career overwhelming the senses that they considered his brand of minimalism dull. In other words, they completely missed the point. Now, it's not to say that minimalism can't be done badly. On the contrary, it can be argued that minimalist efforts often have a a much greater chance of failure than those who simply just choose to go for broke on all cylinders. Now I've spoken before about my distaste for music in the white guy with acoustic guitar or white chick with piano vein, and it's their poor use of minimalism is often the reason why. In choosing to pull back and limit their instrumentation, they draw much tighter attention to the singer and the lyrics, and the swath of trite pretentious garbage that spews forward is evidence enough that these singer-songwriters just don't have anything worth saying. And more often than not, too much minimalist material simply fails because the musical atmosphere lacks texture and thus gets very boring very fast. Let's take a look at James Blake's Overgrown as an example where the minimalism worked. But it only worked because Blake's careful control of the atmosphere and soulful delivery nailed that tricky balance between atmospheric and intimate. And that's a tough balance to nail. I can think of more than a few albums that don't quite manage to hit that sweet spot, particularly in electronica and recently, modern hip hop. So with all that in mind, let's talk about the Swedish electronica duo The Night a band that turns electronic minimalism and turns into something else entirely different. Now, I'll admit right out of the gate that The Knife had a bit of a steep road to climb with me. So electronic acts that tend towards tight, carefully positioned beats aren't normally my thing. And coupled with Karen, Karen Drazier Anderson's borderline incomprehensible singing and the duo's tendency towards oblique, barely comprehensible lyrics, I was fairly certain that this band would wear out their welcome faster than ever. And really, if I was looking to find a band with little to no mainstream appeal, the kind that would brand me as a hipster instantly upon mention, the knife would leap to the top of my list. They certainly weren't doing anything to make themselves accessible or radio friendly, that's for damn sure. And yet... Going through their discography, I started to understand the appeal of the knife. Despite the clipped, clattering beats at the very top of the mix, the band often had an expansive sound that sucked me in more often than not. The juxtaposition between Anderson's vocals and those of her partner Olaf Drazier did a fair amount to win me over, but what ultimately won me over were the lyrics. There's a real bleak darkness and unsettling atmosphere to their poetry that has flavor and real personality. And while I wouldn't call them technically strong lyricists, they are smart enough to convey some potent material. Yeah, they've made some mistakes, sometimes some big ones, but overall their good material has tended to outweigh the bad. So when I heard that the act was, again, accruing critical acclaim from critics and Pitchfork alike for their new album, I was interested. After numerous solo ventures, the Knife had finally reunited for their first venture on their own in seven years. How'd it turn out? Oh boy, this is going to take some explanation. Not only is the Knife shaking the habitual thought-provoking in a way I didn't expect, it's also one of the few albums I know for which I'll have significant difficulty explaining my opinion. Because let me make this absolutely clear, there's a lot of elements on Shaking the Habitual that are compelling, intriguing, and almost inspired, but they are fatally crippled by a series of artistic decisions that ultimately break the album for me. 
Let me start by stating that on their own, a number of the components that went into this album are quite strong. The Knife has always had a gift for atmosphere and ambiance, and they do a shockingly good job cultivating that atmosphere on this album. Much like the Flaming Lips' album from earlier this year, The Terror, the album is designed to feel unsettling and eerie. But while the Flaming Lips utilized overdubs in a very dense mix with half-heard vocals, The Knife opts for a minimalist approach that works surprisingly well, particularly on songs like Old Dreams Waiting to be Realized. In fact, I'll make the argument that with only one exception, The Knife's ambient tracks are easily the best on the album. They feel expansive and rich and do an effective job cultivating the underlying theme of isolation. And considering some of these tracks go on for an exceptionally long time, oftentimes in excess of 20 minutes, it's impressive they can still remain somewhat compelling. But even more of the louder, more richly produced tracks have a lot to offer. There's a lot of variety in the instrumentation and the majority of the rhythm sound unique and polished. And like always, the production is top of the line, with every piece in the mix carefully highlighted. It's clear that many of the tracks were overstuffed with instrumental ideas that some artists would have built entire albums around, and The Knife do an excellent job balancing it out. And while I've never quite been a fan of Anderson's vocals, most of the time here she does quite well. No, there is no track on this album that has the single potential or stands out like Marble House, but she's less grating than she normally can be. And you know... If the album solely stuck to these elements, I definitely understand the shower of critical praise shaking the habitual has been getting. However, the problems began to come up as soon as you start digging into the lyrics and thematic elements the knife are attempting to incorporate. Because, you see, shaking the habitual isn't just your standard moody electronica album, it's your standard moody electronica album that's political and with a message. Now, I don't have issues with political albums. One of my favorite bands of all time is the Anarcho-Punk Collective, widely known as Chumbawamba for God's sakes. And I'll even argue that with few exceptions, The Knife present a good message. It's nothing all that original mind, it's your basic socialist critique of family values, commercialism, and so forth, but it's well thought out and coherent and generally agreeable if you read through the lyrics. And you know, I can agree with the majority of the principles The Knife are presenting, and you can never say that the band is without dour, humorless sincerity in putting forward their message. But here's where we immediately run into my first problem. Notice that I said when reading the lyrics, the concepts are agreeable. That is because when combined with the music, the tonal mishmash very quickly becomes insufferable. Mostly because the instrumentation contains subtlety, the vocals and lyrics definitely don't. I can't help but feel that a defter touch, perhaps more subdued delivery or more refined lyrics could have made their message slightly more palatable. And indeed on the better tracks, the delivery is more refined and more subdued and it works better. But The Knife are not attempting to be palatable in any way, shape or form. Indeed, it's an underlying theme of the album and that in order to the disruption of the established order, those who have benefited from it are going to suffer. It's a defiantly anti-commercial album, which again, isn't something for normally which I would take issue. However, in the refusal to engage with the audience, it makes the knife look, come across as haughty and arrogant, and not in the least bit populist. And as for a message album, that is a critical error in their approach, and also seems contrary to their own ideology. Instead of uniting with the people, the knife come across as above them, only deigning to interact with humanity as if they are as enlightened as they are. In comparison, let's talk about Chumbawamba, a band with politics far to the left of my own, but I'm still a huge fan of their material because it is actively populist. The band works very hard to stand with the people, identifying with their struggles and keeping the political message grounded in simple, accessible lyrics and tunes. And yet, they still manage to preserve the nuance in their arguments and carefully balance it with their humor to make it palatable. In short, to co-opt an overused phrase from 2011, they are the 99%. The Knife, on the other hand, does not deign to stoop to our level. By making music alternatively harsh or gloriously indulgent, the lyrics difficult to parse out, and the message so humorless and dour, they're raising barriers to entry and completely voiding any populist spirit that would make their message infinitely more accessible. It's one thing to emphasize your theme that change and breaking the system can cause unsteadiness and insecurity, but it's entirely another thing for that emphasis to be applied to your own audience as well. And yet, I'd be willing to forgive all of that if the message was delivered in a precise, cutting, intelligent manner. And here's where I must raise the final major problem with this album. A problem I've mentioned a few times before. There is very little, if any, subtlety in the delivery of said message. The absolute worst example of this is fracking fluid injection, which from the title is an obvious critique of fracking, a method of extracting oil and natural gas that can have detrimental environmental impacts. Okay. Fine, that's an interesting topic to build a song around. I'm interested. So do you want to know how the knife conveys their disapproval with the process? I'll tell you how. They write a wordless, nine minute song that only contains roughly two sounds. The squeal of an oil valve 
and the squeal of somebody trying to make a noise through what seems like a gag. How freaking trite. I'm reminded of the movie Monsters, directed by Gareth Edwards, you probably didn't see it, where he tried to make the audience care about his persecuted aliens, not by giving them sympathetic development or morally ambiguous framing, but by having them make whale noises. Not only is the message on this song thuddingly obvious, industry stifling voices against fracking because of money and business reasons and all that, the Knife apparently thought the audience was so dense that they need to stretch out this track for almost 10 minutes without crescendo or instrumental evolution in the slightest. And the infuriating thing is that this condescension is all over the album, particularly on Without You My Life Would Be Boring, a heinously grating track punctuated by baby squeals on multiple registers. Forget nuance, the Knife clearly feel that they're lecturing a hostile audience of children that need to be taught the basics of queer theory, socialism, and environmentalism. But here's the true irony. Since the Knife don't have that popular streak and have made it such a defiantly anti-commercial album, the average listener of this album is often going to be as informed, if not more, about these issues which the Knife presume to be experts. And the people the Knife want to harangue are th never going to pick up this album and certainly won't listen long enough to get this particular message. And in the end, I'm stuck with an album that wants to teach me something I already know and have long ago accepted with the ponderous weight and acrid contempt for the people of a radical politician hammering out talking points. It's Mitt Romney talking to his base. I'm reminded of the newsroom at its absolute worst, a show that wants to change discourse in the media, but instead becomes an echo chamber that occasionally loses that necessary context and nuance to work properly. And really, that's a damn shame. Because there's a lot of things on Shaking the Habitual that I really like. The instrumentation is varied and compelling, the atmosphere is dense and interesting, hell, even the lyrics and ideas and theme are agreeable and not terribly presented. But the combination of all three here is critically flawed and it seriously rubbed me the wrong way. If you're the sort of listener who doesn't care about lyrical cohesion or likes this sort of sound or is in love with the message, You'll probably like this album enough if you're a fan of The Knife. If you're in the audience for this sort of material, this, uh, this album is easy enough to appreciate. Otherwise, look, I'm sorry, but in good conscience, I have a hard time recommending this album. Shaking the Habitual might be an intriguing album, but it's overstuffed with ego and condescension and lacks the potence of message or instrumental populism to make it work. I'd try a little tenderness next time. Or at the very least, some humility. <sighs> Thanks for watching. If you'd like to like and subscribe, we've got more videos on the way. See you next time.